You clap better than anyone. I know, but I, I once did... No a... one normally gets to hear your clap, but we always start each recording with a clap, so that's Mark doing a clap, and my clap is slightly more feeble. And, um... <laughs> I, I once interviewed Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. and it was about the, the re-release, a reissue of uh, Peeping Tom, and we, there, was, it, there was two cameras, so it needed a clap, and the person who was directing the thing said, uh, can someone give us a clap? And I went to do it. And Mark Scorsese said, I've got this. It was like, okay. So Scorsese in the room, you volunteered the clap. No, I was just, just because I... So, and so remind me who you are. And does he do clap? Did, I mean, was a Scorsese clap notably, noticeably no, better? Here's what it was. It, he almost didn't, like when I did it just then, I kind of quite theatrically raised my hands above yeah. my head, you know, hands in the air like you just don't care. What he did was he had his hands in his lap and he just went... It, and it was it was like, okay, because he knew that the shot had his hands in them. So and, and so he just didn't he didn't have to do any theatrics at all. He just literally almost did, did it like that. It was, it was like, yeah, just getting, getting on with this. Are there any other clap stories that you have? No, mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. There's a... There is a story about end slating, which is that some directors don't do. You know, you know the clapperboard thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the old TV show. Yes. No. So there are people who make films now spinning in their grave, going, "Come on, that's not what it's called." When you do the clap, there's some directors do it at the end of a scene rather than the beginning of a scene because when you go action clap, it's sort of you know everything springs into life. And some directors I have heard say, "Yeah, I don't do that. I do it at the end of the scene because I want the thing to just kind of begin organically." The way this podcast does. The way this podcast. Basically. Yeah. Does. Hello. I have been here, but you've been away. So it's just one of those things where you've been, when you've been That's here, I've been away. I've only been away for three weeks, yeah. but because it didn't coincide with your sort of various uh, uh, world tour, uh, <laughs> important it's, gigs it's that just, you were doing. This just isn't true. How was your safari, by the way? Oh, it was, it was fabulous. What was the greatest thing, the very best thing that you saw? On the very last night, um, this is going to sound so naff, on the very last night as the sun was going down, um, we were driving back. And there was a, there's a lioness that they hadn't seen for a long time, and uh, this is Cornwall, yeah. This is Cornwall, yeah. yeah. And um, and as we were driving back the thing, the lioness came out of the thing, and the three cubs which they hadn't seen and which they thought might not have got, just trotted out. I've got a video, of course, I've got a video. Okay, you know the videos that you keep showing me of grandchild one. Yes, yeah. I now have the video of the three lion cubs trotting right. out behind. I've got so so many new ones. Yeah, to show. Really, yeah. okay, great, because it's been a long time. So presumably, grandchild one is now twelve, and that's in South Africa, by the way. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're... it was it was really. It's a wonderful place. It was it was. It, this is terrible because I don't generally do holidays. So it's the first time I've in a very long time that I've just done. Because since then I've been to Shetland because we did the Shetland Film Festival. I'm just back from Shetland just now, and that was that was really great as well. But it was the first time in a living memory, I think, that it was. It, it wasn't. I was going to a film festival, so people came with, or Linda was doing a conference, and so people came. With, it was. It was. No, we went on a holiday. It's oh, quite good holidays. Yeah, you know? no, that was pretty good. I was watching Teletubbies mainly. Ha and it's and you 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 put a thing up that said yes. that you'd forgotten how great it, it was. is a work of genius. It is. It is without doubt a work of genius. And what I didn't realize is in the in the new versions, which is like this is like five or six years ago, Jim Broadbent is one of the was one of the voices. No. Yeah. So they re they, they revoiced it. David Williams is a voice. Uh, Fern Cotton, I think, is a voice. But they anyway. still, it's still dicky dicky bingy dingy ding. Oh, la la po, tinky winky. No, they're the stuff. I mean, it's still tinky winky, dipsy, la la po. Very good. Telly tubbies, telly tub. And the thing that was really remarkable was the again again thing because oh, yeah. it was the it was the first. This is where they where they have a, a short little film of a family or some kids Something. in a playground, and when it finishes, they all go oh again 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 again, and then they show exactly the same film again, and the grown ups go, what are they doing? They're showing exactly the same film again, and the kids are because it's it's it is a scientific thing that they want to watch again, and again. Okay, we could actually put that in take two, can we? Could review Teletubbies. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> why, why? You know, I think I'm going to suggest that. Am I right in thinking, and I may be wrong, that the person who played Poe then became a presenter on CBBC? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not an expert, but anyway, you know, to but be CBBC discussed. CBBC is, is, is a great. Great thing. If we're not going to be reviewing that kind of thing, mm -hmm. what are we going to be reviewing? The Nun 2. 
The Nun 2. The Nun 2. Oh, The Nun 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although well done for preempting the fact that there are going to be a number of where's that going. Uh, and also my Big Fat Greek Wedding 3. So the big, my, so, right, so Big Fat Greek Wedding was an away win. It was. <laughs> and <laughs> past Nun 2. And also big past fat lives. Greek Wedding 3. And also past lives with our, I'm delighted to say, our special guest. Uh, Celine Song, who is the writer and director of that much acclaimed film. Uh, yes, well, you'll hear how acclaimed it's going to be, and many people talking about it as possibly one of the films of the year. I think it is. That's pretty much a done deal. It is one of the films of the year. It's fabulous. Okay. So you kind of reviewed it already. No, no, really. well, I have stuff to say about it, but the point is there's no, there isn't any point in the end of does Mark, No, I think it's wonderful, and it'll be great to talk to her about it. Uh, also, extra takes, more of this kind of uh, rubbish. The weekend watch list and the weekend not list. Five which are great and three you'll hate. Uh, bonus You've reviews. Doing that, uh, you? Pretentious Moi, currently Mark 18, Mark 15. Is that I, right? I, I've forgotten all that. Let's just say that it is. Yeah. And the one frame back is going to be inspired by The Nun 2. Uh, we want to know top Nun films. Uh, we've got a load of those. Uh, also, just a reminder, you, wherever you're listening to us, we can send you our merch because we have drones, basically. Do we? We've developed a whole drone system, so it doesn't matter if you're in... Is that just us talking? Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, we ship to the US and Australia, so you might be, some wags have added, you might be in Jerking Creek, Lower Swell, Scratch Arseware, Fanny Bay, Nether Wallop, Shitterton, Clean Skin Knob, or Wet Wang. We can still <laughs> find these, you with our I, so I have to ask, are those real place They're names? They're all real place names. Are yeah. All, every single one of them. Yeah. And I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do some of them. Because it is certainly true that there, there is a street, as I'm sure a lot of people will know, in... The city of London, um, which refers to a practice that oh, yes. used to go on there right. and had to be renamed a couple hundred <laughs> years ago, right. because I'm not going to say no. it. <laughs> anyway, it's that kind of thing. Uh, Rob in London, um, honoured doctors, given Dr. Simon's personal connection to matters Dansk, I wonder if the esteemed presenters and distinguished executive producer, Simon, have encountered the concept of, quote, Getting to Denmark, viz. Denmark is a mythical place that is known to have good political and economic institutions. It is stable, democratic, peaceful, prosperous, inclusive, and has extremely low levels of political corruption, end quote. I refer to a piece called Getting to Denmark in The New Republic. Sadly, it appears that the sources uh, of this article is the history's over guy, Francis Fukuyama. But I wonder, this is a very heavy um, opening to our is, Welcome yeah, Back welcome podcast. Back. <laughs> but I quite like the utopian social democracy goal. It's very unlikely to happen in the UK. I wonder if the Danes could use a recent mature Hums graduate with a proofreading qualification. I won't hold my breath. So it's interesting. So we're starting off, that's the first email out, out the pile, um, saying what a great place Denmark is and yes. could we do better. Yeah. Interesting that the first email is neither about uh, films no. <laughs> nor, nor streaming services. No, no. It's just it's about whether we can do better than Denmark. But here's, but here's the thing, and I just, uh, th as, we're going, as we're going in okay. with this kind of heavy thing, right. a number of the uh, social democratic uh, countries, as part of the trade-off, because they have very active and very successful far-right parties right. in there, the trade-off is they have to have very strong anti-immigration policies. So, so that's that's the trade-off. And that, so they may, all those comments about Denmark are absolutely right, but they have a very strong far-right party, far stronger than any of the ones in this country. Just mentioning it, yeah. just saying. Same in Sweden. It's an education. Thanks. Anyway, uh, so that was a whimsical start. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you did, you did, however, preface it by Wet Wang Street or whatever. That's true, you know. that's true. Well, in the spirit of Wet Wang, Nether Wallop and Shitterton... Uh, <laughs> there can't really be a place called Shitterton. With many, many apologies to Sufyan Kazi, Simon and Mark... Big fan of you both. Also polite and slightly ironical fan of the redactor, but definitely a major fan of all the supporting team. Okay. Having listened to this show for many years, I'm finally motivated to send in an emergency mail. Okay. As a person with a specific surname, Kazi, I have had the odd fun conversation slash taunt over the years about it. In recent weeks, I was therefore surprised at the casual use of that surname when you were discussing reading material in the toilet. 
Quote, grandfather would take a copy of the Daily Mirror to the outside Kazi, probably followed by the French rule of three. I was probably one of the few who noticed the Kazi remark, uh, but I haven't heard it used in public media like that for a while. However, the toilet topic didn't quite go away. I heard before your extended break, <laughs> Dr. Karen Raj of the excellent The Referral podcast talking about bowel movements. So here I am prompted to email to arrest this diarrhea of bottom biology dialogue. Kazi at least in my surname, is an Arabic word. My family got the name from what I believe uh, because of my great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, as the local wise elder in a village in India. He was often sought out to make decisions on important matters by the local Muslim community. In fact, he became such a go-to person that he earned the title Qazi Sahib, in Arabic Qazi meaning judge. Years later, my great-grandparents moved from India and settled in South Africa where you have just, just been. been. And here's the twist. As a kid growing up many years later in Birmingham, I remember reading an article in the Daily Mirror about the British soldiers who fought in the Boer War. The British troops stationed there would often need to take a number two, uh, trying hard, as it was. The best place to do this near their campsite was the Kazi mountain range. Hence the phrase, in English slang, I'm Ooh. going to the Kazi. Wow. Actually... Uh, anyway, actually, I actually very rarely hear the use of the word Kazi on TV and radio, except on carry-on films. So this was a pleasant-ish surprise. Keep up the good work. Down with the Nazis and wing nuts. Uh, Sufyan Kazi. Wow. And if I can just add on the subject of that, a black mark and brickbats to the production team all round. Really? Yes, because in one of the weeks when we weren't here, and it was being left in the lesser hands. There were only a couple of those weeks. Robbie Collin and um, what's his name? James King. James King, who we invented, who we grew from a plant pot. He's still a child. Literally. Yes, he's, you know, fun. James King used the phrase commode and mayo. He never did. He did. You left it in deliberately. Just pouring myself a stiff drink it's, it's, from my Vanguardista flask. Well, Firstly, Commode and Mayo, James Kermode, King. James I mean, King. The thing is, you can't mispronounce James King, can no. you, really? James Knob. <laughs> so we're, we're keeping with the playground <laughs> theme, which Mr. Kazi has, uh, has introduced us to. <laughs> Did you have a tryhard in the Kazi Mountains whilst you were abroad? <laughs> James King. I That's have remonstrated outrageous. with him. He, he denied it. He said, no, I didn't. I said, you did. And now I discover... That they, yeah, of course there's evidence. It's called a podcast. You can't have... This is a very Trumpian thing. You say something, it's on record. There's a tape of you doing it. And then you say, I didn't do that. Yes, she did. Anyway. That's very... So you're over it anyway. We're finished. I mean, we are... He, as I, to, to quote whatever it is in Four Weddings and Funeral, he is no longer my brother. He's just some guy I met. Speaking of weddings, yes, my big... oh, well done. Thank you. <laughs> well, I thought we ought to have a, at least some film <laughs> reference. Uh, at least, at least one. Um, my big fat Greek wedding three is out now. I confess. So, two thousand two, and Nevard lost had a breakout hit with Big Fat Greek Wedding, which began life as a one woman play and it's big hit. Tom Hanks is uh, company behind it. In 2016, there was Big Fat Greek Wedding 2, and I confess that I had completely forgotten about Big Fat Greek Wedding 2, so much so that I had to go back and look up my review of it oh. to remind myself what it was. This is what I said. I am going to do the thing about quoting myself, but because... Excellent. I, because everyone else that I asked I've in the screening it. room, I'm sure, they couldn't remember it either. So here's what I said. This time... It's the elders who have to tie the knot, providing the poorest of plot excuses for a rehash of the original's crazy family rifts with added mother-daughter separation anxieties. Cue a carry-on carnival of broad racial tics in which no shoulder is left unshrugged, no hairstyle left unteased, no eyeball unrolled or popular national dish uneaten. I chuckled once, but that one laugh was sadly neither big nor fat. Now, and I st that's it. Beyond that, I have no memory of it. Now we have Big Fat Wedding 3, which, in time-honoured fashion, sends the Portocarlo family abroad to Greece, to the village of Tula's now deceased uh, father. Shall we hear a... Yes, shall, please. Shall we, shall we a this, this isn't a clip. This is a trailer. Okay. So this should set the whole thing up. I'm up for this. Here we go. A lot has happened since my big, fat Greek wedding. 
like I never left. Woo! My father passed away, and his last wish was for us to visit his childhood village and reconnect with our roots. So, we're having a reunion. We're going to Greece. Oh, yeah. One, two, three, four. And by we, I mean oh, the whole family. Oh. Who wants souvlaki? Paging souvlaki. Anybody by the name of souvlaki on this flight? All right. There we are. Yeah. So that's so... We're He's, doing a big promo for uh, for this film on uh, on Great Sits Radio, so I think it's excellent. A, I think it's great. Excellent. Have you seen it? No, no. But I'm fully supportive <laughs> of it. So, apparently, she promised to take the father's journal back to the village to sh to give to the to the friends of whom she has a photograph. I mean, this is this is just like. It was a short plot meeting. You know, how are we going to do it? Oh, yeah, he was. He, he required. He wanted us to. I think that they said that. So, joining her on the trip is the daughter, who the family is trying to match make with Aristotle. There is her, Aristotle. Yeah, not that Aristotle. Another Aristotle. There is, <laughs> although actually would have been a more interesting. Film. I thought it was going to maybe one of those Indiana Jones endings <laughs> right. where they go back and they have <laughs> Greek philosophers turning up. And then there's the brother has got something about head of the family there's something that he needs to do which is not very secret and then there are various aunts and cousins and people that are all delivering the pithy life messages and of course as you saw from the thing there was the no popular national dish unflaunted the, the camera begins at the beginning going all over food when they get to the village they find it is deserted everyone has has has, has left but the mayor is get this a blue-haired feminist literally yeah. With blue in her hair because she's alternative, so she has a blue streak. So it was like they were they were calling out across it to you know to. to Did she smoke audience. a pipe? No. And so you know, people often say, "Well, oh, and on that show, they just they judge a film on its politics." You know, they judge a film on its politics. So they talk like that. They do talk like that yeah. when they say it as well. Yeah. So this it has PC themes about about tolerance and harmony and alternative lifestyles and about accepting you know fluid. Sexuality and gender, embracing refugees and immigrants, and it has all those things. What it doesn't have is <laughs> laughs or credibility. The tone of it is like a gurning TV soap in which the gag, you know, you have a catchphrase or you have several catchphrases and they just say the catchphrases over and over again. So that's a Greek word. That's a Greek word. That's a Greek word. That's bad luck. That's bad luck. That's bad luck. You know, it, somebody's shaving their nose hairs at the dinner table, which appears to go on forever and ever and ever. And then there's because they're in a village, there are humorous encounters with goats. Of course. And the, some of the performances are so bad that I've been re-watching Twin Peaks recently. I don't know whether you remember, but in particularly the second series of Twin Peaks, there are these very kind of... You rewatched the whole of the first series and then you were rewatching the second series. Yeah, this, the first series isn't very long. Okay. It, it really isn't very long at all. The, there's these kind of almost theatrically odd performances, but because it's because it's David Lynch and it's Twin Peaks, you go, okay, well, it's meant to be theatrically odd. And in this, it's just go. I'm not sure if that's theatrically odd or just bad. The plot is contrived to the point of parody. Nothing rings true. Nothing makes any sense. Even as the voiceover attempts to make everything ring true and attempts to make everything make sense. There was one chuckle that I had in which one of the characters says, that's not how we do things in this family. We yell, we scream, we find solutions together using threats and guilt. That's good. I, yeah, quite, th I quite that's like a, that. That's a good line. That's not enough to fill a feature. Oh. It's it's very not good. It's very, very, very not, not good. good. Very not good. Did the Elgin Mar Marbles get a reference? <laughs> the Elgin Marbles. Do they, are they in there? <laughs> no. Miriam Marbles? <laughs> Is she in it? <laughs> Have you ever met Miriam Margulies? I have, yes. Have you ever heard Miriam Margulies doing an audio book of Charles Dickens? I feel as... She does all the characters. Ah. Uh, I'm quite jealous of people who can do that. Yeah, she does all the characters. Anyway, yes. Big Fat Greek Wedding 3. I don't think it should be troubling cinemas for very long. I'm fully insupportive of it. I think you're, it's, you're completely it's very good. It. I think it's excellent. Okay. And um, fully, you know, I'm just trying to not get into like trouble. Would you like um, excellent. So my big fat Greek wedding three. There you go. Uh, movie number one. Still to come, Mark. What else are we going to do? Still to come. We will Nuns. Be Nun two. The Nun two. And past lives with our special guest. Writer and director Celine Song. We'll be back before you can say there are two things a person should never be angry at. What they can help and what they cannot. Plato. 
Can I just say, by the way, yes. um, that any listeners in Scandinavian countries who like to correct me on my very broad brush uh, approach to uh, <laughs> social democratic politics and government, uh, but, you know, that's really based on a skimming the economist kind of knowledge. Really, it didn't sound like it. It really? sounded like it was a thorough deep dive. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, please feel free to correct me if I've got any of that wrong about what's really happening in Denmark <laughs> Sweden and other countries which make up Scandinavia, like Holland, for example, and also Belgium and Luxembourg. You do realise if somebody just started listening to this podcast out of nowhere, they would wonder WTF was going on. They would, and to which the easy answer just for that one is that Mark was convinced that Holland was part of Scandinavia. Convinced is a strong word. I just thought it. <laughs> but <laughs> there are many things that I just think. Yes, but the, crucially... I used to think that cats were female dogs. Crucially, the thought was verbalised, yes. and it was a thought that should have stayed a thought. Yes, and that is the lesson that I have learned increasingly doing this show. When things come into your head, you don't need to say them out loud. Yes, that's, that's true. There's a difference between breaking wind and trying hard. <laughs> Does that work? Uh, Scott Thomas says, I'm not sure if Robbie and James suggested feature of... Who? James? Who? Jam Let's mispronounce his name. Jamis. J Jamis Kung. Uh, I'm not sure if Robbie and James's suggested feature of film titles your parents have mangled will take off. Did they suggest this? Apparently they did. But my mother once told me she'd enjoyed What We Did on Our Connolly, starring Billie Holiday. <laughs> well, you can, see, you can understand how that might have actually happened. Scott, there you go. You're giving more oxygen to Robbie and James's <laughs> idea. And Maddie says, uh, following James and Robbie talking about films pispronounced, I interpret... Uh, sorry, I interrupt. <laughs> I'm going to say that was deliberate. Yeah. I interrupt my grocery shopping to message you because my mum could potentially win this round with Lawrence of Alabia. <laughs> this is now firmly in the family vernacular. That has to be a porn movie. There has to be a porn movie called that. There will be now. <laughs> this is now firmly in the family vernacular along with her multitude of other spoonerisms and malapropisms. Um... Ord box, cardinary box, which we deciphered as ordinary cardboard box, but she said Ord box, cardinary box. Durex paint. <laughs> and spaghetti bollock naked. Now I don't believe that last one, because those, those two could be porn movies. Who would star in spaghetti bollock naked? <laughs> James King. Anyway, Maddie, thank you very much indeed. Uh, <laughs> correspondence at kerberdomain.com. Uh, box office top 10 at 16, uh, Passages. Yes, which is the Iris Axe film. Iris Axe made uh, Love is Strange. This, is, this is a really interesting film set in Paris about um, a married couple, same-sex couple, one of whom starts having a, a fling with a with a woman, and they think it's it's fine because they've got a sort of you know a, a certain openness in their relationship. But then the, the, everything starts to become complicated. This got into a, a, a big problem in America where it got slapped with an NC seventeen rating because it's got it's it's one of the few films in which the 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 this, the intimate scenes really move the story forward. You 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 find out about the relationship between the characters and the way in which they they interact physically. And in America, it got an NC seventeen certificate, which is the kind of commercial kiss of death. So it went out un, unrated. This had prompted a, a discussion that I had about the fact that America has an infantile rating system, which is everyone can see everything except the, except the films that are for grown ups. In which case, if it's not pornography. There isn't a place for it to go. Uh, there was a very good interview with uh, Iris Axe uh, on the show in your absence, which people should uh, ch check out. I find that hard to believe. What, that Iris Axe was on the show? No. But it was very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, Rachel in Reading, I saw passages at Berlinale in February with an Iris Axe live Q&A yeah. and have been waiting since then to see it again. I love this film and it has remained in my top three of the year, all year. It's I remember fine. thinking how refreshing it was to see actual sex scenes after what feels like years of cinema playing it safe. Uh, Rihanna rightly brings this up in her interview with Sax. It was also mentioned in the Q&A I attended in Berlin. I too struggled to feel much empathy for Thomas. Instead, I felt for Martin throughout the film in what was possibly one of Ben Whishaw's best performances. As Sean says, the film is a study of the destructive nature of narcissism. 
If Killian Murphy deserves an Oscar nomination for Oppenheimer, then Ben Whishaw deserves to be nominated twice for his performance. Ben Whishaw is fantastic. In the, I mean, I thought it was really good, and it was really good to see a film, as I said, in which those intimate scenes are absolutely moving the plot forward. They are part of the narrative. Uh, number 10 in the UK is Cobweb. Which Dear. is... Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. No, 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 I insist. No, no. I was just going to say that the most interesting okay. thing about it is that there is a there's a drum and lace score, uh, Sophia Hultquist, which I've been playing on Scala, which is very, very fine. Sorry, carry on. Buddy. So you interrupted just to plug your radio show? No, I interrupted to say, yes. Thank you. Dear host and contributor, says uh, Andrew Miller, Esquire, 500 metre backstroke certificate, Prince 2 practitioner. Prince that? 2? What's that? Is That's that like, the number 2. Is that like if you you like substitute Prince? Prince 2 practitioner. Anyway, whatever one is. Whatever it is. That's Andrew Miller. Well done. If, if, if that's what you think you need in your life, Andrew Miller is the person for you. I just got home from seeing Cobweb, and I, a lifelong horror fan, was extremely impressed. The slow, menacing creep of this movie was a terrifying sorbet to the quiet, terrifying quiet... Terrifying sorbet? Yes, I suppose, you know, like a... Taster. An aperitif. An amuse-bouche. An amuse-bouche. <laughs> Maybe. I think that's the correct use of the term. <laughs> to the quiet, quiet bang nonsense I've endured recently. Uh, Lizzie Kaplan and Anthony Starr are delightful as unhinged parents, but the real star is the house. It's a movie that isn't shy about letting creepy wallpaper take the lion's share of the screen while our protagonist cowers in the corner or allows your eyes to adjust as the camera slowly zooms towards a terrifying hole in the wall. The third act gets crunchy in a delightful way. That's For me, it was phrase. mildly let down by the final minute, but then the same thing. Feel free to redact all of that. <laughs> anyway, I don't think that's... I think that's fine that's perfectly to fun. say. Perfectly yeah. fine. And, and if you're a fan of genuinely creepy cinema, it's a hard recommendation from me, if that means anything. It says Andrew Miller, the practice, the practitioner of The Prince Twos. And uh, bear in mind that on the subject of The Quiet, Quiet Bang, we are going to be reviewing The Nun 2, which is textbook Quiet, Quiet Bang. OK. Apparently it is a... Say that again, please. Production... It's a project management qualification. Is it? Yes. So uh, Andrew Miller is one of those. Very good. If you want... A, uh, if you want your project managed... I can't think of anyone better. No. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Correspondence at codemail.com. You give him a jingle. If you want your project managed, Andrew mm. Miller. Mm. Number nine in the UK, 12 in America, Haunted Mansion. Yeah. Eight here, three in America, Blue Beetle. Well, I appear to like this more than anyone else that's been on this show recently. I thought it was... I don't care about anyone else. No, but I... Well, okay. But I, I did think it was one of the more enjoyable superhero movies, largely because I think it genuinely is about family. And I had gone into it with fairly low expectations, and I came out very, very pleasantly surprised. Number well, seven in the UK, number eight in the States is The Meg 2. And, and again... Um, Robbie Collin said he he said it should have been called Meg Poo the Stench. Okay, he was, was, was raising the bar. I think it's well. I enjoyed it. Okay, it starts so so, then it goes goes a bit mad, and then at the end it goes absolutely full whirly copter versus tentacular thing coming out the sea, bonkers. And I enjoyed it, and I I stand by that. I had fun in the cinema watching it. Number six is Elemental. There was a conversation in your absence when uh, Robbie Collin asked me if... Some, no, somebody wrote in to say, had an interview ever changed your mind about a film? And I said, well, actually, I think in the case of Elemental, it did. Robbie said that he doesn't believe that his opinion about a film has ever been changed by an interview, in which case he is a tougher man than I. I remember very clearly that your interview with the director of Elemental, Peter Song... That's correct, is it? I think, yes... So, um, did make me like the film more, partly because it was evident that he that it meant so much to him that it made me kind of rethink my. I still have problems with the with the element stuff with the fire water mm -hmm. how they lived together. But I, you know, I thought, I thought that that was a case in which I was affected by an interview. And interestingly, the South Korean immigrant experience will be coming up later in the program. It will. It's a very different film, but it's the same. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. same subject. Absolutely. Matter. 
Uh, number five in the UK, number six in the States, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Yeah, fine. I mean, kind of fun. And I mean, arguably the the best of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I, I, I still, I mean, the first one was, it may have been rubbish, but I'll say it again, you know, it was the most, it was biggest selling indie movie at the time. And I remember being in Hollywood when it came out and just being astonished at what was happening. And number four in the UK, number 17 in the States, is Sound of Freedom. Yeah. So, you know, unremarkable uh, child sex trafficking exploitation thriller in which Jim Caviezel, outspoken QAnon advocate Jim Caviezel, plays the uh, real-life figure of Tim Ballard, who makes it his mission to save children from international paedophile rings. The film has been endorsed by the likes of Donald Trump, who... Uh, who did a screening of it at his Bedminster golf club. Of course he did, because um, if when when this was reviewed on the show, people wrote in, firstly people wrote in and said, why haven't you reviewed Sound of Freedom? You're scared to review Sound of Freedom. Well, it wasn't out. And then when it was out, it got reviewed. And uh, Anna Bogoskaya talked about it in context, because you have to talk about it in context. Um, the film would not be troubling the charts or this program if it hadn't been involved in, if Trump hadn't done screenings of it, if a bunch of uh, nutball right-wingers hadn't come out and said, oh, yes, you know, such an important film, such an important film. Just brief kind of primer on this. Um, Trump has spent a lot of his time dog-whistling to the QAnon nutball uh, right-wing lunatic fringe who believe, in inverted commas, that uh, he is involved in a fight against a cabal of satanic paedophiles. Um, uh, there's a very fine uh, uh, podcast series uh, which you and I both listen to, The Coming Storm. Yes. Um, about If you don't, don't make QAnon, if you have any, sim if you have any sympathy or Q QAnon, uh, I'm not interested in, in anything you have to say. Uh, but if you want to find out about it, do listen to that series. And so obviously Trump doing a screening of the movie uh, was important because he's dog whistling to the QAnon lot. He'll never say, oh yes, you know, I need their support, but he's dog whistling to them. Yes, I am involved in a, in a, in a fight against this stuff. Um, the director has complained that there are people that are too close to the film uh, that are that are in politics, and you know, because it's, 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 the film itself doesn't discuss any of that stuff. It's just a, as I said, a completely unremarkable and not very good um, nuts and bolts exploitation thriller. But the movie wouldn't be here on the show if it wasn't for the fact that it had been involved in all this stuff. And when Trump is doing screenings, and when your leading man is Jim Caviezel, Jim Caviezel played uh, Jesus in the Passion of the Christ. It seems to. Have, become convinced that he really is the Messiah. He has said Donald Trump is the new Moses. Um, right, and, it kind of tells us everything. Yeah, he's an idiot. Um, he's also a very bad actor um, because when I look at him, I can't see anything other than an idiot. It's just, you know, when somebody's personal uh, behavior is so rampagingly stupid, if you have a moment, Google Jim Caviezel's behavior on the set of Person of Interest. So it's... Like I said, there's there's nothing else to say other than if in any other world this either wouldn't have been released or it would have gone straight to video because it's been picked up by the right wing and, and the director complaining about that. Shut up. Nobody would have seen this film if it hadn't been picked up by these lunatics. It's now being used as a kind of, you know, yeah, rallying cry. Just shut up and live with it. For example, these are, these are both... Uh, from our social media, someone called Love Light Peace Five Eight Seven. Hmm, I've never known anybody normal <laughs> put a number. At Here the we end. go. All right. Turning a blind eye to child and human trafficking, you are part of the problem. When someone is trying to show the world what's going on behind the scenes, can't stop the truth. Sound of freedom. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yep. Uh, and someone called So Many Taken Names. If the film's rabid fan base weren't so set on thrusting this film into the culture war at every opportunity, then there wouldn't be any need to talk about the politics surrounding it. Criticism of the film or its creators isn't an endorsement of child trafficking. If you're one of these people, I hate to break it to you, but liking this film doesn't make you some sort of moral crusader. Being against <laughs> child trafficking makes you normal. Yes. <laughs> anyway, hopefully this will disappear very, yeah. very quickly. And, you know, I come back to the thing about you don't want to give it the oxygen of publicity or indeed the oxygen of oxygen. Number three uh, is Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer has And number done, two is Barbie, so yes, I don't know yeah. if you want to take Well, no, no, but together. that's just significant because Barbie is now off the top spot for the first time because it's been knocked off by Equalizer 3, which we'll come to. It is The, the success of Oppenheimer is extraordinary. The success of Barbie we all, <coughs> we all know about now, but the fact that a movie that is three hours long, that is, large parts of it are people talking in rooms, and it is quite a challenging film. That it has done as well as it has done is, I have to say, I mean, a real industrial surprise it's 
it's incredible that it's done as well as it's done. Barbie is great fun, and I really, really like Barbie. But I am, you know, as a Christopher Nolan fan, it, I, when I came out of the screening of Oppenheimer, I would have put, you know, a pound to a penny that it, 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 it would get great reviews, but it wouldn't be a runaway financial success. And it is. Yeah. One of the one of the many, many reasons I'm disappointed that um, because of various contractual you know, diary clashes, we uh, the Chris Nolan conversation never happened. But uh, his casting is, is astonishing. We all know that he likes to work with with certain people. So there was a conversation about um, whether he should have employed a, a Jewish actor to play Oppenheimer. But OK, so that so that's one mm. thing. Then Oppenheimer's wife is Emily Blunt. The first uh, fling he has is Florence Pugh. So. Uh, okay, and then um, uh, Einstein. Oh, it's uh, Tom Conti, the president of America. Um, uh, oh, he's from London because it's Gary Oldman. <laughs> and all, just all the way through, there must have been some Americans thinking, hang uh, on a minute. Ha- are we- this film's directed by a limey. Have I missed something? <laughs> anyway, Oppenheimer 3, Barbie 2, two and as you equal- said, Equalizer three. 3 at 1. So, you know, reteaming Denzel Washington and Antoine Fuqua, which is a partnership that in the past uh, bagged uh, uh, Washington, the best actor Oscar for training day. So this time... He's facing retirement. He goes to Italy, Sicily, Yamora stuff happens. It's business as usual. I enjoy it because I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it is absolutely what it is. Uh, Here is a lovely BBFC quote, okay? The violence is bloody and brutal, but typically occurs in sudden brief bursts. Now, the thing that I love about that phrase is, firstly, that's true of if anyone has ever seen fights in pubs. Violence and mm-hmm. brutal, but in very brief bursts. I mean, pub fights last about four seconds and they're horrible and nasty. There's nothing glamorous about them. But it is like, yeah, that's pretty much right. So, you know, there's, they list shooting, stabbings, garrotting, the use of improvised weapons. It's all the stuff that you expect from that kind of, that kind of thriller. And it's well done. It's efficiently done. You know, it's done with a certain land, a certain flair, and the performances are... You know, yeah, I like the first two, which I've seen well, in wrong order. And then but, you, know, you will like. I will the, do. They will like number three because you, you'll be pleased to know it's not breaking any rules. Excellent. That's a, that's a very good thing. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking to Celine Song uh, very shortly uh, and talking about her extraordinary uh, debut film. Uh, before we get there, podcast. Uh, to bring to your attention, coincidentally, coincidentally. Made, made in this very building. Really? Yes. Yeah, so it is just a co. It's not a coincidence. Uh, made by the very nice people at Sony Music Entertainment with Kathy Burke. It's called Where There's a Will, There's a Wake, and it's um, a show that invites guests to talk about their perfectly planned funeral and laugh in the face of death, Mark. <laughs> this week's episode is with one of the finest directors to come out of the UK. He is Sir Steve McQueen. You'll hear Kathy and Steve talk about the upcoming film Blitz that Kathy is appearing in. He discusses his new uh, doc, Occupied City, and a poignant moment with his father that appeared in one of his films. I actually helped dress my father. Oh, did you? Yes, I went to to The Undertaker's because my uncle, he he wasn't wasn't a bad dude. He said, Steve, you should come along. You should help dress your father. Yes, my dad's dead and I'm holding his hand. But then I realised, you know what? There was something non-elegant about him not having gloves on. Oh, okay. So I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go and get him some white gloves. Mm. I just love the idea of him having these beautiful white gloves. Mm. So I remember lifting his hand up and then putting the gloves on his hand. I remember he had an accident at work a long, long time ago when I saw, I think, a hammer fell on his, on his thumb and there was a little scar on his thumb. I remember holding his hand and saying, oh, that's that scar there. And anyway, I put the gloves on his hand. But it was interesting to touch him when he was dressed and, yeah, and I put that scene in Widows. Yeah. The scene in Widows when Viola Davis is um, putting on gloves on her son. Right. So I, yes. went to, I went to mark that moment with that. And it's a very she she she, she broke down doing it. It was, it was extraordinary, but she you know, she portrayed it in that movie. But mm-hmm. I went to mark it with that visual. So Steve McQueen talking to Kathy Burke, and that episode of Where There's a Will, There's a Wake is available now. Worth saying as well, if you go into the back catalogue of our show, there's a, a, a program in which Gary Oldman came on. And he talked about, because uh, it was the, the re-release um, of Nil by Mouth, for which Kathy Burke won the uh, the award at Cannes. Kathy Burke's performance in that film 
is astonishing. I mean, it is a really, really astonishing performance. If you get a chance to go back and listen to Gary Oldman talking about it, because it's a, I mean, that's a, it's a really fantastic film, which is, you know, very much about fathers yeah. and things. But he was, and he, he was talking about that. He, he also came in to talk about Slow Horses, yes, um, the TV show which he was filming, um, and he said in that in that conversation, I went to America for a day to do Oppenheimer. He did, he did, because Christopher Nolan. <laughs> Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan went. I've, I need another Brit. I mean, this is all fine, but I need, I need another... But he did that in a day. I, I mean, I know he's just got a, f- a few lines, but it's still quite an important scene. No, it's a very important scene. It's a very important scene, yeah. He's played an American president, Harry Truman, and he's played Churchill. Winston Churchill. I mean, this is an astonishing actor that we're talking about anyway. In fact, I might go back and listen again to some of our greatest hits. Yes. Good name for a TV. Yeah, I was just thinking. And a radio station. <laughs> uh, anyway, more in a moment. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? Yeah, and if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I I would. I have done. Excellent.